We were discussing the sigma algebra generated by a random variable x. <coughs> we defined this sigma algebra as follows. We took this space omega so fp, that is my random variable and we said that you take all the Borel sets uh, and take the pre majors under x, all right. Take all those subsets of omega which are pre majors of Borel sets under x, right. So, in particular we defined <coughs> this as the set of all subsets of uh, omega such that uh, a is equal to x inverse b for some Borel b. <coughs> We can show that this is a sigma algebra, uh, that is a very elementary proof, you have already proved it in your homework, right? just definition chasing. Uh, now, because x is a random variable, every one of these a's is also f measurable, it is an event, right? because pre images of Borel sets are events. Therefore, uh, sigma x is not only a sigma algebra, it is also a sub sigma algebra of f. Right? So, we said so, this is a sigma algebra uh, and it is contained in f. <coughs> so, the sigma the sigma of x consists of all those events here whose occurrence or non occurrence is determined by the realization of x, x of omega. All right? So, it contains all sets of the form. So, it is any typical A contains it is of the form x inverse b right which x inverse b is what so if you remember so recall that x inverse b is simply the set of all omega uh, in omega such that uh, x of omega is in b correct that is the definition of x inverse b. Uh, so, it essentially contains all these sets. So, the moment I give you the realization x of omega, so when the randomness omega realizes I can determine x of omega and I can determine for each Borel set I can determine whether that x of omega lies in that Borel set or not, right. So, for each uh, so for each of these sets A which are of the form x inverse B I can determine whether they occurred or not, correct. <coughs> So, which is why this sigma algebra represents all those events here whose occurrence or non-occurrence is uh, completely determined by x of omega x, right. Is that clear? Any questions on this? Sometimes the sigma of x may be uh, as big as f, right. Sometimes it may be much smaller than x, uh, f. So, for example, uh, just let us just take that uh, this as your omega b uh, lambda. See this is your uniform probability measure on 0 1 and you take uh, the cutates and consider the random variable indicator of whatever set you like you tell me some set you like canter set or some interval or right you tell me whatever set you want let us say interval uh, 0 1 third for whatever reason right. Right this is the indicator that my omega falls in 0 1 third ok. So, in this case <coughs> let me just call this I a ok this is my event a. Okay. So, this I a takes only two values right 0 and 1 correct. Uh, 
right. So, this will be equal to 0 if omega is not in uh, 0 1 third, it will be 1 if omega is in 0 1 third. This set could be anything, any Borel set. Now, this is a random variable, indicated random variable. Now, what is the sigma algebra generated by this? Ha, huh. so it's the so you can you can show that can verify. Sigma of I A, so I am just calling this I A is equal to omega phi, which should always be there, and A and A complement. Right, it only cons consists of these four subsets, omega phi, which will always be there, and A and A complement. This is a sigma algebra, and this is in fact the sigma algebra generated by the indicator random variable. In fact, this is true for any set A, any Borel set A, correct? And this is a much smaller sigma algebra than my f, f is b here, right? Uh, but on the other hand, if I consider the random variable x of omega equal to omega, let us say, so which is a trivial random variable, it just gives me the value of omega itself, right? In that case, sigma of x will be the Borel sigma algebra again, right, because this is the identity map, right. So, is this clear? So, I just a very trivial example. In fact, for the constant random variable, what happens? The random variable which takes constant values of probability 1, right. So, the constant is a random variable, right. So, x is equal to some 1 with probability 1 if I say right that is a all these omegas map to all these omegas are um, with probability 1 the sample space the omegas map to just some constant c right. So, in that case your ha huh, your uh, your generated sigma algebra will be the trivial sigma algebra omega and phi right. So, that is the random you cannot you cannot look at the constant random variable and decide anything about <coughs> the occurrence of any other subset. You know that omega occurred and phi did not occur, that is all you can say, right, looking at the realization, the constant random variable. Is this clear? <coughs> any questions on this? Okay, so, this is a concept that we will use uh, when defining independence and so on. Okay, so, we will draw upon this definition later. Okay, just keep this in mind. So, we will move on to the next topic <coughs> which is several random variables. So, when whenever I say several random variables, so when I am considering more than one random variable, so all this random variables will live on the same probability space. Okay, so th they're all on omega f p. Okay. <coughs> so they're not different; they're not random variables living on different probability spaces. Okay, they're all defined on the same omega f p, and each of them will be a measurable function from omega to r. Okay. <coughs> so, why so in terms of motivation right. So, as I said a random variables uh, a capture some numerical function of your elementary outcome. So, if you are looking at some complicated phenomenon like weather or something you may not even be able to capture what this omega is it is some very very complicated process right you do not know what the probability space is. But you may be satisfied by knowing the temperature which is a numerical function of what realizes that day right. So, <coughs> but you may want to know more than one such numerical function, right. So, it may be that uh, the weather is whatever some complicated space, we may not even know what omega f r, right, and your weather on particular day realizes, then this guy may be temperature, one random variable may be temperature, 
then there may be another random variable somebody else may be interested in measuring let us say humidity or something else some other numerical function. Okay. But the point is that both these random variables, so you are, you are measuring different things, but it is the same underlying randomness that is feeding these random variables, right. The probability space is the same and the elementary outcome little omega is the same and once little omega realizes this guy may, may capture the temperature, this guy may capture the humidity or to make a much simpler example, if you are tossing 10 coins, someone may, be, so this x may measure the number of heads and y may measure the number of tosses until I saw the first head or something like that, right. They may be measuring two different things or simply the number of tails, right. But again, the underlying randomness feeding these two random variables is the same, right. They are all living in the same probability space. Is that clear? So, whatever it is that we said about, so you may, so for this random variable you can completely characterize, characterize it with its probability law P x. Similarly, this will have a P y uh, and uh, you can specify you, or you can specify just the C d f capital F x and capital F y, right and all the properties that we said hold for both these random variables. <coughs> so, if you just want to ca capture the statistical properties of this separately and this separately we know how to do it, right. However, so in several random variables uh, the main issue is how is in capturing the interdependence between these random variables, okay. So, it is not so important how, so I mean so a single random variable if you just look at the probability law of x you have a complete characteristical characterization of x and similarly for y, right. Uh, but remember that these random variables are coming from the same probability space and so if I tell you that the temperature on a certain day is in a certain way, it may tell you that the humidity has to be in a certain way perhaps, right. It may tell you some information because the underlying randomness is the same, right. So, if this was measuring the number of heads and this was measuring the number of tails, right, you, you can clearly see that there is a dependence between the two, right, because in this trivial case what is a, not a head has to be a tail, right. But in general the, the structure of interdependence could be quite complicated. So, this is not the picture we will study if you have multiple random variables, what we will study is this picture, okay. You have the same omega f p, but instead we will look at the map x y as mapping into R 2, okay. So, what I will do is this is x comma y, okay. So, every time omega realizes I am going to say that I have a point in R 2, right, rather than just look at the two separate real lines, okay. And this will capture my interdependent structure. Is that clear intuitively? So, that is what we will study. Similarly, if we have n random variables, we will look at it as a x 1, x 2, x n are the random variables all defined on the same probability space. You will look at it as a map from omega f to r n, okay. Everybody with me? Now, uh, you now, you, so now these are random variables, right. So, you have to look at so, in the, the single line we said oh the this is sigma algebra on the real line is the Borel sigma algebra that is the sigma algebra I care about. So, the pre images of that guy may be f measurable, right. So, we know that x and y are like separately random variables in the sense that if you give me a Borel set on R pre image will be f measurable here also the same thing holds true, but here I am living in R 2, right. Now, this random variable x comma y lives in R 2, right. So, you would imagine that this probability measure on omega f is being some is being pushed on to R 2 by the pair x y just like x is pushing a measure on to R 
you would imagine that x y induces a measure on R 2 on the 2 dimensional plane correct. Now, except that you want to have a sigma algebra on this right on R we know that this is a Borel sigma algebra right. <coughs> if you want to push this measure on to R 2 we have to say what sigma algebra you are pushing it on to right. The answer is that I will not say this very I mean in, you know, in great detail, but you can define a Borel sigma algebra on R 2 all right, which is essentially the sigma algebra generated by well it can be generated in multiple ways again just like on real line we can we generate it with open intervals or semi infinite intervals and so on. On R 2 you can you can generate it by uh, what is the equivalent of uh, an open interval. an open ball an open ball in R 2 right. So, you can generate it with an open ball open the set of all collection of all open balls in R 2 uh, equivalently you can show that you can generate it with open rectangles you, you can show that it gives you the same sigma algebra, uh, but the generating class we will consider is in fact semi infinite rectangles ok which means sets of the form uh, minus infinity less than or equal to x less than or equal and minus infinity is cross minus infinity less than or equal to y <coughs> ok. Uh, so, we will look at uh, so the Borel sigma uh, can be looked at as as the sigma algebra generated by the pi system on R 2 which is again as <coughs> this pi system on R 2 is uh, the set of all semi infinite rectangles ok. right. So, you take sets of that form right and you take intersection find countable intersections countable unions and complements and whatever it is the, the collection of sets you get is the Borel sigma algebra on R 2 ok. So, it is the logic is exactly the same just like you have intervals on on the real line you use open rectangles or open balls you can show that if you use these semi infinite rectangles or if you use open balls you get the same sigma algebra ok. So, yeah I mean the way I mean it is a little bit of a non trivial proof because with this these have edge these these are they are like rectangles, but if you have to generate balls from them I guess if you want to generate <coughs> something like that you have to uh, approximate it by a sequence of some sets right you keep you, you keep uh, you construct the countable sequence of sets in R 2 such that the ball can be uh, the countable union is the ball right. And then to get the other way around to show that these kind of sets can be generated from the open <laughs> balls you have to make up some other argument right, but you can do it ok standard proof ok. So, so far you can believe it at least uh, all right. Uh, that is good. So, this is the Borel sigma algebra on R 2 and also uh, you can also define a Lebesgue measure on R 2 ok. Lebesgue measure on R 2 corresponds to area ok. So, what you will do is oh I have uh, these uh, these uh, generating classes which are essentially rectangles right. So, minus infinity. Uh, so, what you will do is you take some rectangle of side A and B you will say that I want the measure of that set to be a times b right the area right. And then you uh, you take f naught which is a countable union of these rectangles and you assign whatever measure you want to it right the measure which is the area. And then you invoke Kara Theodori co verify countable relativity of p naught and you will get a measure on this right same procedure I am not repeating it because it is the same thing right. In fact, you can do all of this in R n nothing changes right. So, you can get a Lebesgue measure on R 2 which is defined on this Borel sigma algebra 
which corresponds to area ok. So, that is well and good. So, you have Borel sigma algebra on R 2. Now, so now we want to talk about. So, let us say you are given some complicated Borel set here right. I want to talk about the probability that. So, let us say this is my Borel set B. It need not be something nice. It can be something quite crazy. In fact, on R 2 there are a lot more crazy sets than there are on R right. Now, R you can count some Cantor sets and so on. Here you can do all sorts of things right. There is Cantor dust. Uh, there are all sorts of fractals on R 2 right you can create some totally crazy sets and some of the many of those are actually Borel ok. And you want to talk about the probability that x comma y lies in some Borel set right. Now, the question is is an event like this. So, if you take ideally we want to talk about this right omega belongs to omega such that x comma y which means by which I really mean x of omega comma y of omega lies in some Borel set. So, this is some Borel set in R 2 ok. Whenever I write x comma y in B, this is some Borel set in R 2. Now, is this an event? I ideally want to talk about something like this correct agreed. So, is this an event meaning that is this what is inside this p see I can talk of p of something only if it is f measurable right is what is inside this this guy f measurable. See if you give me Borel set on R I know that how would you have x lying in that b or y lying in some other b prime right they are all separately f measurable, but if you give me some Borel set on R 2 what do I do? Do we know that it is f measurable? It is not obvious, you have to prove it. This is true, ok. This is in fact f measurable. But you have to prove it, ok. So, the way to prove it is that so you know this, right. So, you know let us say that. So, ok let me. So, I, I will do one thing. So, instead of rather, rather than pr prove this in class, I will give this to you as a homework as a guided proof ok. Uh, this will be a homework. You have to show that these kind of. So, for any Borel set B in R 2 it is a little bit of an involved proof it will take 5 to 8 minutes to do it properly. So, I thought might as well just do it in homework. So, this set you know that the pre images of Borel sets on R are f measurable for both x and y, but if you are given some Borel set on R 2 you want to prove that the pre image is f measurable right. Only then can you talk about something like this correct this you will do ok it is actually an I mean you, you just have to do it properly it is not sophisticated or anything ok. <coughs> so, you have to show ok this is homework. there will be a guided proof ok you will I will not just say prove this ok I will tell you how to do it in the problem ok. Uh, all right good. So, you want to do this right once you have proven that this is f measurable I have a probability law for Borel sets on R 2 correct. So, this is what this is what is the, this is the probability law after all right. So, this is you can denote this as p x comma y of b right this guy this guy is defined to be equal to p x y p x y of b. Okay. If you did not prove this you cannot speak of this event right you cannot say speak of this probability if you did not prove that that set were to be f measurable right. You do not need any further assumptions you can just prove it if x and y are separately random, random variables in the sense that pre images of Borel sets are f measurable you can prove that this is an event ok with me. Ok good. So, this is my probability law on R 2 right. 
probability law. So, this is called joint probability law. This is the joint probability law of x and y. So, this specifies everything there is uh, to capture about the interdependence of x and y, right. So, you give me any Borel set you like on R2, I can tell you what the probability of x and y mapping into that Borel set is, right. So, I can tell you the probability of x and y mapping into that Borel set. That is what this prob joint probability law tells me. Okay, and that is a complete statistical characterization of not just x and y separately, but jointly, right. From the joint probability law of x and y, can you generate the probability law of let us say x? How will you do that? So, you will just the b you feed into this will simply be. So, you have some Borel set on R, okay. You say that b cross R, right, that will be a Borel set. You feed that in, you will get the marginal probability law of x, right, of x alone. And similarly, for y, if you want the probability of y lying in some Borel set, you feed the set, the set you feed in here will be. R cross whatever set you want, right? Those are all Borel sets you can show. Okay, so from here you can get the uh, individual marginal probability loss of x and y separately. However, if you are given the probability loss of x and y separately, you may not be able to get the joint probability law. Okay. So, separately specifying p x and specifying p y for all Borel sets is not enough to obtain p x y of uh, on, on R 2, okay. <coughs> because you are losing out on the interdependent structure that you only say what the, the statistical properties of x separately and y separately is not capturing the interdependent structure, right. Yes. No, it is not true. No, I did not say anything like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, they have to be defined on the same probability space. Okay, so you you have some underlying space of coin tosses or dice throws or weather or whatever x and y are both defined on the same random on the same probability space. You cannot have x being drawn from some experiment involving coin tosses and y being involved from something else picking a random student or something right that is not what we are talking about we are talking about all all random variables are living on the same probability space. Uh -huh. sigma x and sigma y. Uh -huh. Uh, they will be of the same uh, probability space, right? Well, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is, so yeah. So, sigma x will be some sub sigma algebra of f. Sigma y will be some other sub sigma algebra of f. They may or may not be the same. There is no constraint. There is no constraint at all. If, if, if they are similar, if they are equal, uh -huh. that doesn't mean that x and y are equal. No, they are not. But right? Not. Yeah. It is not true that if sigma x and sigma y happen to be the same sigma algebra, it does not, it is not at all true that x and y are equal. But both match the probability p to p x, right? That is true, but however, the interdependent structure may be quite complicated. So, if you give me a Borel set here, the set of all pre images of Borel sets may be the same as the set of all pre images of Borel sets here. So, if you take to give you a very simple example, let us say this is 0 1 interval with. And then you take x of omega equal to omega, y of omega equal to 1 minus omega, right, to make a very trivial example. Then both sigma y and sigma x are in fact the Borel sigma algebra, but I mean, so you cannot say anything about the random variables, right. Is that okay? Okay, good. So now, huh, so where was I? So that is the joint probability law. 
if you know the joint probability law you know everything about the statistical joint statistical properties of x and y. But knowing separate probability laws p x and p y is not enough to conclude what p x y is the joint probability law is. So, in particular I know that so I know that the Borel sigma algebra on R 2 is generated by semi infinite rectangles right. So, since uh, sets of the form minus infinity x minus infinity x cross minus infinity y R Borel Borel on R 2 P x y of that guy is well defined. Correct. So, it is defined for all Borel sets. So, it must be defined for the generating class. Right. I mean I am repeating the same argument I did for single dimensional one dimensional case right. Okay. And this is called the joint CDF joint cumulative distribution function. Okay. This is we will denote this by f x comma y of little x comma little y which is the probability law assigned to these semi infinite rectangles. Okay. So, this is to write it out fully this is the probability of omega for which x of omega is less than or equal to little x and so I should really write uh, x of omega less than or equal to little x intersection omega for which huh, so I should really write this right. So, I should I will never write this again just for once I will write this. I will abuse notation from now on. So, I should write correct. So, but this is what I mean this is abbreviated as probability of x less than or equal to x comma y less than or equal to y again abuse of notation a serious abuse of notation, but this is what I will write from now on, but whenever I write this I actually mean this. Okay. This is called joint CDF. Okay. with me. So, 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 uh, uh, from, uh, from from yes. uh, individual probability law we can get joint probability law because the probability machine is defined as uh, sigma of si No, you cannot do that I mentioned this earlier. Uh, if you are given this p x y the joint probability law you can clearly get individual probability law by putting one of them to be r right the other you keep whatever Borel set you want. But if you are given the separate probability laws p x separately and p y separately you may not be able to figure out what the joint probability laws cannot be done in general. In fact, in the example I gave right the, the omega and 1 minus omega example I gave. Uh, you, if you give me the separate probability loss they will both be uniform, but the joint law is not a uniform measure on the unit square ok. You just think about what I just said ok. The example I gave on you take sample spaces the 0 1 interval you take x of omega equal to omega and y of omega equal to 1 minus omega ok. And the separate probability loss will be uniform on 0 1 for both cases, but giving p x and p y separately will not give me p x y. Okay. No, but p x may not be Lebesgue measure. 
right i mean so pxy may be some arbitrary measure right for you know even if px and py are separately lebesgue measures the pxy may not be the lebesgue measure on r2 that's exactly the example i'm giving you okay okay so so far okay so now again so this is a complete intellectually it's a complete repeat of what i said in r okay actually people don't i mean you can do all this on rn and just forget about it once for all okay so now what what am i going to say so if i give if i give you the probability law i can specify the cdf like i have just done the question is is the opposite true if i give you the joint cdf is it true that i can generate the joint probability law because this is what completely specifies my uh, my statistical properties of x and y together right what do you think why it is a pi system right so this is this defines my measure on the pi system on r2 which is these semi semi infinite rectangles and you know that from the theorem we stated but did not prove that if we specify a measure uniquely on a pi system it gets uniquely specified by specified on the sigma algebra also right correct so the joint cdf uniquely specifies the probabilities of all borel sets on r2 fine it is because of the pi system theorem we show we we derived you can make a note of that as i said everything is a repeat right so i don't uh, this class is a total repeat except for the first few things i said so okay so i have started stating some properties of the joint cdf uh, most of these are along the same lines i mean along expected lines uh, if you know the probability of one dimensional cdfs so you are looking at two random variables so we will always use this notation okay capital f and index by the random variables capital x comma capital y if these were x1 x2 x3 or whatever you will write x1 comma x2 comma x3 and uh, the arguments are these guys x less than or equal to whatever right so as you would imagine uh so this is a function of two variables right so you should look at the the plot in 3d right so when x and y both go to infinity the joint cdf goes to 1 and when x and y both go to minus infinity uh the joint cdf goes to 0 okay you will again prove this the same way okay you can this you can show using continuity of probabilities okay just like we showed it in the one dimensional case so one remark here is that when i write something like this limit x tending to infinity y tending to infinity uh, i mean that x and y can go to infinity along any trajectory in any order so normally i should write 
limit extending to infinity then limit y or in some other way right. So, when I do when I write limit extending to infinity then a limit y tending to infinity I mean that the inner limit goes first right, but if I write something like this I mean that it does not matter how these x and y go to infinity right you can go along any trajectory ok. So, no matter how these what the trajectories are this is limit is equal to 1 similarly no matter what trajectory along x and y go to minus infinity this limit is always 0. then you have monotonicity f x y of little x 1 little y 1 less than or equal to f x y of little x 2 little y 2. this is again obvious because. So, the set of omegas that map to less than or equal to x 1 less than or equal to y 1 is smaller than the set of is contained in the omegas that map to this semi infinite rectangle right. So, this will follow. F x y is continuous from <coughs> from above i e f x y of x plus u y plus v where limit u down going to 0 and v going down to 0 is equal to f x y of x y for all x y. here. So, here so this here this is a three dimensional function right. So, you have to be a little bit careful. So, let me explain what this means. So, you are looking at so let this is your let us say this is your x plane and this is your y plane ok and you are looking at what the CDF is doing coming out of the board right. And you are saying that if you take any point uh, here all right and if you approach this point from above meaning that so your v so your u is your x variable isn't it yeah so your u is coming like that and v is coming like this right so if you just imagine a axis here so your u and v can approach zero in any order or any rate but they have to come down to zero so, you can either have this go to 0 first and then that go to 0 right or you can go on whatever trajectory you want right you can do that right you can do that right u comma v can go to 0 uh, any whichever way you want except you cannot do that or do that right you, you should not approach like that or approach like that or approach like that right. So, as long as u v approach to 0 like that you have the limit will be equal to the functional value which is what continuity from above means ok. This is the equivalent of right continuity in two dimensions ok. So, both u and v have to approach from the positive coordinate right never going to any of the other coordinates right then you are ok then this limit will hold. Okay. Again this follows from what result? How will you prove this? 
continuity of probabilities right you consider any sequence u n going to 0 v n going to 0 going down to 0 and you just write it out and you will apply continuity of probabilities. Okay. Everybody with me? <clears throat> Finally, I put one property which uh, this is all basically a repeat of what we said for one dimension. So, I will just one I will just put one property which has no uh, corresponding equivalent in one dimension because it talks about the marginal limit. So, if you have f x y of x y you send uh, y to infinity you should get the marginal of x uh, y to infinity you should get the marginal of x. And similarly, if you send x to infinity This is true for all x, this is true for all y. So, what this is saying is that if you send one of the arguments in the joint CDF to infinity, the function you get will be a function of the other variable and that function will happen to be your marginal CDF of x. See the marginal CDF is nothing but the CDF of x okay, except when you have two variables you will, call it the, you will call the CDF of one of them as a marginal and call this as the joint right. This is your familiar old CDF of x which is this probability that x is less than or equal to x. Similarly, this is probability that y is less than or equal to little y. Again the proving this will involve sorry ah, you should use some continuity of probability result you will fix an x and send y to infinity along some sequence and you will end up with probability that x is less than or equal to x okay so given the joint so given the joint uh, cdf i can determine the marginal CDFs, the separate CDFs of x and y, but the opposite is not true, right. Given this and given that separately, there is no way to figure out the joint probability, joint CDF, right. In fact, given you can that you can show by counter example, right. You can take two CDFs, uh, marginal CDFs corresponding to two different joints. If you can construct even one such example you have proved that given these two you cannot reconstruct this, but of course given this you can reconstruct the marginals right. Essentially the marginal only captures the statistical behavior of that random variable whereas the joint the CDF will capture as the name says the joint uh, as the joint uh, distribution right which is the it captures the interdependent structure between x and y. Any questions? Can we define the conditional CDFs? Conditional. Ah, we will de define conditional CDFs later. Okay, I'll stop here.